So recently, I've been interested in really getting into a study, a scholarly study of the issue of the authorship of the canonical gospels, the four canonical gospels in our modern Bibles. Now, I've long known some things about this. I've read scholarship on the issue before, of course, but have never really dived deep into it. Well, now is as good a time as any, I suppose, and I have been reading some critical scholars like, you know, Bart Ehrman, obviously, but also Raymond Brown, Dale Martin. Now, these are liberal, very non-conservative scholars on the issue, so that got me to thinking, what are the conservatives saying? What are the Christian scholars teaching at Christian seminaries? And so I typed into Google to find out what are the largest seminaries in the United States, and it took me to this Christian Post page where apparently the largest Protestant seminary, at least, is Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So I went back to Google and I typed in the SBTS Academic Catalog. It took me here, and this is the 2019 catalog, but that's okay. We don't really care about the date. Uh, you can see that it has two intro New Testament courses under the Biblical and Theological Studies block. Apparently, the first semester course is just on the Gospels themselves, which is perfect. The second semester course is, of course, on the rest of the New Testament. So, of course, the next step was to find a sample syllabus, or a past syllabus from some past semester. And I went to Google, of course, and I did come up with this. This is on some WordPress website, I guess. Who knows where that's, uh, what that's all about. But here it is. It's an intro to the New Testament sample syllabus for the first semester on the Gospels. And this is, as you can see, from SBTS. So let's see, let's look at the required texts. That's what interested me first. And you can see the first required text is Charles Hill, Who Chose the Gospels? Now I did check out that Charles Hill book, but it doesn't go into issues of gospel authorship. So on to the next book, Mark Strauss, Four Portraits, One Jesus. So let's see what Strauss has to say on the issue of authorship. We'll begin with Mark's gospel. We're going in order that Strauss presents these issues. Now, I want to read aloud this first paragraph here, and the reason is, this is really the long and short of his opinion on the authorship of Mark. He doesn't go into any detail about arguments or evidence. He just says his opinion, which is as follows, quote, Like the other three Gospels, this one is anonymous. By this we mean that the author is not named in the body of the text, although the original readers would likely have known his identity. The title, According to Mark, caught a mark on, was probably added when the Gospels were brought together into a collection. Despite this anonymity, there is good reason to believe that the traditional identification of the author as John Mark, the companion of both Paul and Peter, is an accurate one." Unquote. So yeah, I mean, he thinks that Mark wrote Mark. On the other hand, he does acknowledge that the Gospel was originally anonymous, and that it only came to have its title attached to it after the Gospels had been collected into an anthology. This is my view as well. Strauss next tackles the issue of the authorship of Matthew's Gospel, and you can see what he's written here. He does seem to acknowledge that uh, Mark and Priority seems likely. In fact, when he summarizes the case against uh, Matthew and authorship, he says the following. I want to read this aloud to you. Many scholars, he says, doubt Matthean authorship for a variety of reasons. Number one, Papias' statement can't be trusted since the first gospel reads like a Greek original. Number two, Mark and Priority, remember that, he does agree with Mark and Priority, although tentatively, renders, he says, Matthean authorship unlikely. Why would an apostle and eyewitness borrow from the writings of a non-apostle? Number three, the gospel reflects the concerns of second-generation Christians, and so is unlikely to have come from an apostle. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm happy that even at the largest Protestant seminary in the United States, they are teaching some critical scholarship, some skepticism. That's a good thing. That's more than I expected, to be honest, a lot more. On the other hand, I can't help but be a little disappointed, maybe even more than a little disappointed, because the reasons that he lists here, these three reasons for doubting Matthew and authorship, don't strike me as the strongest reasons. Now, at the risk of going off on just a little bit of a tangent here, what do I think are the strongest reasons? Well, if we look at the internal analysis of the Gospel, if you read the Gospel with an eye for math and authorship, it just doesn't strike a chord. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Well, for instance, Matthew only appears in the gospel one time. That's when Jesus sees him and calls him to follow him. Matthew drops what he's doing and follows. We're given no personal details. We're not told what he was thinking, what he felt. Nothing that might indicate that Matthew is even a source for this text, much less its principal author. Matthew is mentioned one more time later in the gospel, but only as part of a list of Jesus' disciples, not as any part of the narrative. Nor does the gospel follow what you might imagine to be Matthew's perspective. If you were to set aside for a moment all of the traditional baggage that we usually are accustomed to carrying with us, that is to say about uh, Matthew being the gospel author, if you were to set that aside temporarily and just read the text on its own, apart from any external concerns, you would never for a moment suspect that Matthew was the author of this gospel. It simply has nothing to do, the text doesn't, with Matthew's perspective, his feelings, his character. So I think for me, that's really the biggest reason for rejecting Matthean authorship. And then the other big concern is rejecting the traditional ascriptions. I simply don't trust early church tradition. Now that's me, and perhaps you disagree, but those would be the things that I would cite as reasons for doubting and even rejecting Matthean authorship, not these three reasons that Strauss gives. So when Strauss, for instance, says that none of these arguments is decisive, that is to say the three arguments that he lists, well, yeah, I mean, I agree with that, uh, but there are other arguments. Anyway, so Strauss does side with Matthean authorship, and I think this last paragraph is worth looking at. He says, in the absence of better evidence, the strong church tradition tips the scale in favor of Matthean authorship. Well, okay, that was to be expected. I really don't think that SBTS is going to teach their students anything other than that Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, and so on. But to his credit, he does make this note at the beginning. He says, quote, the mixed data means a conclusion on authorship must be made with caution, unquote. And so, you know, obviously, I personally wish that he would have given the critical scholarly view a much more serious treatment than he actually did. On the other hand, at least he didn't completely sweep it under the rug. The next gospel on Strauss's list is, unsurprisingly, the Gospel of Luke. Now, as far as I can tell, Strauss never comes right out and says who he thinks wrote this book, but... I think reading what he has to write here, that it's pretty clear he does think Luke wrote Luke. He says, for instance, quote, Early church tradition unanimously ascribes these works to Luke, that is to say both Luke and Acts, a physician, he says, and part-time companion of the Apostle Paul. This external evidence can be supplemented with internal evidence. And then he goes on to list some of that supposed internal evidence. Now, Strauss doesn't completely stop there. He does say, for instance, quote, Some have doubted that the author was a companion of Paul, claiming that their theologies are different, and that the portrait of Paul in Acts is different from the historical Paul of the epistles, unquote. On the other hand, it's clear that Strauss is not buying this argument. He writes later on, While there are different theological emphases, there is nothing contradictory in either theology or portraiture, unquote. So, it's clear that Strauss is not buying this skeptical argument. He seems to think that Luke really did write Luke, and anyone reading what Strauss has to say about it is going to get that impression as well. So the last gospel on Strauss's list is the Gospel of John. And he does start off by saying that the fourth gospel is anonymous. It doesn't name its author. He says something curious, though, Strauss does. He says that the gospel itself identifies the author with the beloved disciple. That's really not true. And he gives this quotation here from John chapter 21. I would like to turn to that passage from John. This is John chapter 21. Let's take a look at what happens here. Now, the scene is set here with Jesus predicting Peter's death. And it's not just for our benefit. It's not like he's talking to us as the readers. He's talking to Peter. And of course, Peter is not happy at all to hear about this horrible death that he's going to have to die. Well, it turns out that the beloved disciple happens to be with him. So Peter looks at the beloved disciple and he looks at Jesus. He said, well, what about him? What about the beloved disciple? And Jesus basically tells him, don't worry about the beloved disciple. Worry about yourself. You know, if I want him to do something, well, what's that to you? You've got to follow me. And so then the author picks up here, and this is no longer Jesus talking here in verse 23. Uh, the author says that Jesus wasn't really saying that the beloved disciple wouldn't die. He only was scolding Peter, more or less. 
And that's when the author writes verse 24. He says, quote, This is the disciple, that is to say the beloved disciple, who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true, unquote. Notice how I emphasized those pronouns. The author has differentiated himself using a first-person pronoun with the beloved disciple by using a third-person pronoun. Now, this isn't the same as just writing in the third person, as some authors, not many, but some, did in antiquity. In fact, the author does use the first person, and it's right here in verse 24, the very verse that Strauss himself quotes. Now, you might wonder, okay, maybe the author isn't identifying himself as the beloved disciple, but what is this about the beloved disciple writing stuff down, writing down his testimony, and why is the author of the fourth gospel talking about that? Well, the truth is, we don't know. Different scholars have floated different hypotheses. Uh, one hypothesis is that maybe it was a written source that the author was using, that the author attributed to the beloved disciple. That's a possibility. Or maybe there was an earlier form of the Gospel of John, maybe that only contained chapters 1 through 20, and then chapter 21 was added by a later editor who thought that the beloved disciple was the one who wrote the earlier form of the Gospel. Whatever you make of verse 24, though, it's certainly not true that the author is identifying himself with the beloved disciple, as Strauss claims. It's just not what it says. But alas, that is what Strauss tells us, and so he goes on to try to identify the beloved disciple. I don't think it'll surprise you to hear that he settles on the Apostle John as the most likely candidate. Now again, he does talk about uh, some objections and some questions. See what he wrote here? But, but questions have also been raised, he writes. And then he talks about in another paragraph, challenges to Johannine authorship are also made from, and he continues on with that. Again, I don't think that these are the strongest objections against Johannine authorship any more than I thought that the reasons he, he listed challenging Matthean authorship of the first gospel were the strongest in that case. I think he has tried to maintain a fair tone, though, and I can't fault him for that. He has his opinions, and he's not shy about telling you what they are. But at the same time, he recognizes that other scholars disagree, and even though he's not going to let on that he's the one in the minority, well, he does tell us that those scholars have their reasons. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say for now about the Strauss book. Let's look at these other two books. Uh, we have Pennington, Reading the Gospels Wisely. I did look that up. That doesn't talk about the authorship of the Gospels at all, so we can skip that one. This next one here, The Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, it kind of discusses the authorship of the Gospels, but only from a historical approach. Let me give you an example here. This is one of the articles in that dictionary, and this paragraph here is pretty typical of how they discuss the issue of authorship of the Gospels. Let's take a look here. It says, quote, In the 18th century, G. Lessing in 1778 was one of the first to question the apostolic authorship of John and to argue that the author amplified the nature of Jesus... And it just goes on like that. In other words, we're not hearing about any of the actual arguments or evidence for or against the traditional authorship ascriptions. And the folks writing these articles certainly aren't taking a stand one way or the other. It's just a historical overview, very typical of an encyclopedic tone. But at any rate, yeah, that's what they're teaching their students there at the supposedly largest Protestant seminary in the United States. It could be worse, I suppose. I mean, they are talking about the scholarly disagreement. They're giving some of the arguments, even if they're not the strongest ones, against the traditional view of things. On the other hand, I think it's a real shame that they're pushing this minority scholarly view and not even mentioning that it is a minority view, that the majority of biblical scholars don't buy into this traditional authorship business. I mean, I get it. It's a religious institution. They're going to push their religious views, but they could be honest about the scholarly situation. And from reading the Strauss book, I felt like he wasn't being completely transparent about that. But anyway, I think that's all I have to say on the subject for now. So I'm going to go ahead and end the video here. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I want to learn more about this, and uh, I plan on reading some more. So I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Y'all take care.